Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time today uh, and in the invite from Fame to, to present uh, this morning on temporary works and health and safety regarding temporary works. Uh, like Tim said, my name is David McNair. I'm the regional engineer for MGF. Uh, so I do a lot of temporary works designs and promote temporary works be best practice within the, uh, the, within the construction industry. Adrian's one of my colleagues uh, who's also an engineer. We do, we've probably got a couple of thousand designs and checks uh, that we've done over the last, uh, what, seven or eight years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So we're quite well experienced um, in temporary works. In my background, I I've worked on site as well for Balfour Beatty, so I've got kind of got a contractor's uh, practical side of things and uh, the kind of technical side with uh, uh, designing temporary works. Uh, very brief agenda of what we're going to run through today. Um, I'm just going to introduce MGF and the Temporary Works Forum, TWF, uh, go through what temporary works are and why they're required, uh, a bit about the process, and then Adrian's going to go through some products uh, and case studies and questions after uh, Luke's uh, presentation as well. So for those who don't know who MGF are, uh, we're a temporary works equi equipment specialist. Uh, we uh, hire and sell uh, temporary works equipment, um, predominantly in excavation support, uh, but we also go into structural support, uh, safety and lifting products as well. Established in 1981, so we've got about 40 years experience in ensuring the ground uh, and those Little yellow dots there, you can see, uh, are our depots. So we've got nationwide coverage uh, across the country um, with a central engineering function in Manchester where, where myself and Adrian work. I've uh, got 450 employees across the business. Um, we've won numerous awards in, in terms of innovation and safety. Uh, and I think that one thing that stands out, uh, or makes us stand out from our competition is we uh, design and manufacture all of our products. Uh, we've got our own transport fleet and engineering, so we've got full control logistically um, in terms of you know, receiving an inquiry and, and getting it to site. And then we really invest quite a lot in terms of our equipment as well. Uh, and grow uh, as we're a growing business, uh, we're um, introducing more depots uh, around the country. Uh, to the side of that is the Temporary Works Forum, which our engineering director is a, a founding member, uh, formed in 2009. Um, by senior engineers within the industry, um, from consultancy, consultancy suppliers, contractors. Uh, there was a need for a, a forum for temporary works to be discussed, uh, look at best practice, promote temporary works, um, because it's usually an afterthought. Uh, we get phone calls all the time. You know, we need some temporary works and it's very last minute. Uh, so we're trying to break down those barriers and make um, temporary works the first thought when you start on site. Um, the Temporary Works Forum is made up of uh, organisations from clients, contractors, uh, consultants, suppliers, academia. Um, so there's a wide ranging kind of um, membership base there. Uh, they meet regularly, similar to these types of meetings uh, to discuss um, issues with, with Temporary Works. And it's got the support of the IC, Institute of Civil Engineers, Institute of Structural Engineers and the HSE amongst others. Um, and on their website, there's a lot of free resources and useful links. Um, I think there's even a, a free kind of temporary works uh, course to, to go through uh, online. So moving on to temporary works then. Um, I don't know if you can see that there and read that, I'll read it out. Uh, but this is the, uh, so there's a British standard um, uh, on temporary works, BS5975. Uh, and this is their definition of temporary works. So temporary works can be described as providing an engineered solution that is used to, to support or protect either an existing structure or the permanent works during construction or to support an item of plant or equipment or the vertical sides or slopes of an excavation during construction operations on site or to provide access. It's used to control stability, strength, deflection, fatigue, geotechnical effects and hydraulic effects within these limits. So that's quite wide ranging. There's, there's loads of different facets and elements to temporary works. And you can see from that photo there, uh, you've got the temporary access um, hacky tower coming into a cofferdam. You've got the sheet piles to, to the rear of the photo. You've got some hydraulic um, frames, proprietary frames uh, that we kind of supply. And then you've got temporary structural steel frames and the supports below being welded in, into position there. So we obviously just kind of we're focusing today on excavation support in terms of for the archaeology side of things, but it's above and below ground and, and temporary works is, is very wide ranging. Uh, we play this video, uh, a bit of a warning to it is, um, it's not well, does it? 
it, sorry. It doesn't end well. It doesn't end well for the, the, the guy at the bottom there. So I don't know if you want me to play it or not, but a bit of background. Um, it's, four, it's not in this country. It's four or five meters deep there, unsupported trench. It looks quite relatively stable. I think you'd probably um, agree with there. Um, but I'll play this on and just, it's more to show you how quickly an excavation can collapse and uh, there's no sound to it. So if you are, it, it, look, look away if uh, you're a bit um, uneasy about these types of things. Um, but yeah, he's, he's obviously late. And we use that as a kind of a shock tactic to, to show you how things uh, can quickly change. And why they're required, so why temporary works are required. So there's a legal requirement under CDM, uh, Regulation 22, basically states that all steps must be taken to prevent um, any danger to a person, um, to provide either support to an excavation, or you can simply batter it back if you've got the space to. Um, and it happens in this country, so yeah, not too far away here in Harrogate, uh, from York is Harrogate. Uh, that was a couple of years ago, uh, four or five meter deep trench, no support. Uh, luckily the operative, there was a, a trench collapse operative uh, managed to get out unscathed. But you can see how many people put their, themselves at risk to, uh, to, to get him out, specialist rescue teams. Um, directors of companies, uh, I think as uh, the excavator driver, we're, we're both jailed uh, over a fatal trench collapse uh, down in Northamptonshire, I think it was, on a housing site. No support there. And, and one thing CGM uh, doesn't state is depth. Um, I think probably 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was a kind of mentality of like anything above 1.2 metres is OK. Um, but that could be 1.2 metres of loose sand that could quite easily collapse in on yourself. You might be 1.2 metres deep, but next to a building, building could start to move. Uh, it depends on the ground conditions and what's around it. So there's no kind of depth stated there. Um, and you can see the last photo there, an operative probably kneeling down to do some kind of utility connection, probably a shallow one and a half metre deep trench. If that did come in on him, it's still probably a couple of tonnes worth of material that could either cause serious damage or, or worse. Um, so yeah. Amongst other things, there's uh, a legal requirement under CGM. Moving on to uh, kind of a, a general project structure. Um, so you obviously have the client, principal designer and designer. As a supplier for as MGF, we work with either a subcontractor or principal contractor. So we kind of fit in there on, on that kind of side of things. But under CGM, we also have duties as a designer um, and we have challenges to get the right information to produce our designs. There isn't that link from us to the principal designer to get that kind of information sometimes. So we struggle with that. Um, probably just about to see this, but uh, that's an extract um, of kind of a temporary works process really, uh, taken from the CPA uh, guidance note about management of temporary works, which is a free kind of resource you can, you can download and we'll share the links afterwards uh, about how to get the access to this kind of stuff. Uh, but it's kind of a flow chart there of, um, from princi the principal contractor side of things. Um, so the, the person on site who manages temporary works is called the temporary works coordinator, the TWC, and they'll collate information um, before it gets to kind of us in terms of ground conditions, what's around the excavation, um, and produce a temporary works design brief. Um, that then kind of can get sent to kind of suppliers or designers, like temporary works consultants who will present, uh, produce a design, specify equipment, and that, that's kind of fed back and then um, used on site uh, where temporary work supervisors, TWSs can then brief the team on how to install the equipment or build the equipment and then install the equipment, equipment uh, and have that ongoing maintenance and inspection regime of when stuff's in the ground, make sure everything is okay. So that's a very basic flow chart there of uh, how temporary works are, are managed. Uh, and there's kind of three 
kind of elements and stages to temporary work. So there's planning and investigation, design and construction. Uh, so ideally, we'd like to be involved a lot earlier on in terms of uh, being uh, early supplier involvement. Um, that's where we can add value in terms of um, developing schemes, providing options to discuss first with principal contractors. Um, it's all about value and, and lightest lean is a, a solution, more sustainable as well in the longer term. Uh, so we will have to discuss uh, things like site investigation. You know, if you need to dig to three or four meters deep and the SI we've been provided is only one meter deep, you know, we don't know what we're su um, supporting beyond one meter. So we need to have that kind of upfront um, conversation with people, maybe have a additional SI uh, kind of uh, done. Um, and then one of the most important documents, with, which I kind of touched on before, was a design brief. And that's um, where you gather all the information in terms of the boreholes, groundwater, what's around the excavation, what the hazards are, um, how big you need an excavation, how much working room do you need around it, uh, what you're trying to build. Obviously, it's a little bit different in the archaeological, uh, in the archaeological sense, and how you um, install equipment as well. There's different types of ways of installing our equipment. So we, we try and uh, plan and uh, provide those time for options. Um, use it sometimes months in advance of a project like actually landing on site. Uh, and yeah, we've kind of already touched on these types of things in terms of permanent works drawings and, and, and surcharges around the excavation. Um, the second part is the design. So when we get that brief uh, from, from a, like one of our customers, one of the contractors, um, we produce our own request form and we manage it in a electronic format. And that's kind of our workload and how we manage it. We, we get through about 4,000 designs a year. We're constantly uh, producing temporary work designs. Uh, we'll review it to, um, which I'll touch on in a second, uh, categorizations of different uh, uh, temporary works, complex, uh, all to do with uh, temporary works complexity. Uh, we'll produce some design documents uh, use some analysis software, uh, identify the risks, which will then be kind of transferred onto one of our drawings, which uh, you may see, it may have seen on site where um, we'll have like a plan view of what equipment we, we specify and how to install it. Uh, there's different types of things like the weights of equipment for lifting operations, that kind of thing. And it just gives you an idea of what the equipment should look like once it's installed on site. And that's the role of the TWS to manage the installation and the kind of inspection of that equipment on, on site. Once it's been designed and drawn, there's a separate uh, engineer that will um, check um, the calc uh, and the drawing, make sure everything uh, is, is OK and safe. Um, uh, so there's, yeah, there's quite a bit of work that goes into producing a temporary works design sometimes. And then that's kind of fed back to the customer and uh, approved and make sure they're uh, happy with it and issued for construction. Um, As I mentioned about design categories, uh, BS5975 has four categories. So CAT 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, higher the number, the higher the risk and, and complexity in, in the design. So CAT 0 is uh, very low risk, shallow excavations that you'll probably see, uh, where we have our, a, a suite of standard solutions that um, range from a meter to three meters deep. Um, so we can issue those quite quickly because they're all pre-engineered. Uh, CAT 1 and CAT 2 are where we have separate engineers within the same company uh, designing temporary works and checking them. Uh, and then CAT3 is kind of a high risk stuff where a member of a different design team, a different company will check our work. Um, so yeah, just a bit of an awareness there of different categories and different checks. And there's also risk levels well, as well within the CPA guidance, uh, which again, can't really go through in too much detail at, at time, but um, higher the number, higher the risk. And then once uh, kind of our designs are passed to the site for construction, um, obviously we've fed, out, fed some risks back to them, which we can't design out and which will be on the drawing. That should really be kind of uh, added to the method statement and risk assessments on site, brief to the operatives. Um, obviously everyone signed up to them. Um, and then the TWC or TUS will issue permits like permits to excavate and strike. And I'll have some routine checks about, you know, just checking the excavation for kind of signs of movement and settlement and that kind of things. Um, and during the installation as well, just checking things like if we've considered kind of a firm clay on our design, 
and you, you dig it out loose sand, that's a whole point really you should stop because that does have an effect on the loadings on our equipment. So things like that to be aware of um, that, uh, during the process really. And this is a, a kind of very brief summary of uh, what kind of spoke about. So it's, it's all about information gathering, producing that brief so we understand what you need to do. We'll produce that design and then transfer that back by the calcs and drawings, identifying hazards and risks. But once the equipment is kind of sent to site, we also do have, say, systems of work, drawings and animations um, about how to safely build our equipment and install it on site and what to look out for. And we can always come to site and, and um, kind of pr provide that aftercare and, and discussion um, if, if any issues do arise. I think now agents may go on to some showing probably. Okay. Morning, everyone. Uh, as Dave's pointed out, I'm Adrian. I'm a design engineer with MGF. Um, <coughs> Dave's actually already highlighted a lot of the doom and gloom associated with poor method and the absence of um, temporary works uh, support within an excavation. Now, before I start, I know what you're all thinking, and yes, you would be right. This is exactly the same shirt made by the same company that they provided to Harrison Ford when they made the Indiana Jones movies. I'm a bit of a fan. Um, now, a lot of lay people such as myself might look at archaeology and the methods and processes and think that it's all about dodging poison darts and leaping over crocodile pits. But then in reality sets in and you, uh, you get to understand that it's more of a sequential a uh, progressive kind of excavation, painstaking, requires a lot of patience, probably a lot more patience than what I could ever muster. So what I just wanted to point out to you is a, a couple of systems that are available. Um, I'm not going to make this commercial in any way, really, but make you aware of options and choices that can be utilised effectively for any given site, or the vast proportion of sites anyway. Uh, the first system here is made out of GRP. Uh, glass reinforced plastic. Uh, it's called the Vertishore system, that particular one. There's a family of them. They're, they come in various kind of forms, and uh, but the, by and large, these are very, very lightweight. They're manhandleable to the point that you could get two people on either side of a trench and they could literally lower it in themselves. You don't need plant to do so, which is very useful in confined spaces, tight areas, or even if, even if plant access is not uh, available uh, in a particular given area. Um, the way that this actually works, I'm not going to go through this in big detail, uh, it works on a soil arch in principle, which involves compressing the soil around the excavation to ensure that it doesn't move. Um, further information can be provided on that at any point if anyone feels that something like this could be very useful to you in, in future. It's fire retardant, it's, um, it's not non-conductive, they use this a lot on things like railways incidentally when they're actually putting in uh, ducting underneath the railway track. So the applications for this um, it can be quite varied. It's also very limited because you can only go so deep. Maximum of just over two meters. Um, it's GRP. It's strong-ish. If, you, if you're in and around uh, a large building such as this, an old building particularly, it's not really suitable for using something like this. So we'd then move on to something a bit more robust and a bit stronger made out of steel something like a box system potentially um manual boxes trench boxes there's a again there's a whole family of boxes that could be utilized depending upon the plan dimensions and the sizes and the depths that you go into uh, but nevertheless there's, there's quite a few options uh, available for this um, the great thing about these is that they're easy to install you dig a bit you push the box down in the corners you dig a bit you push the box down progressively until you get to the depth that you want to go to the bad news about these is that because they're big and they're strong, they're also pretty heavy. So as a result, there's a trade-off. And these are always the things that need to be considered uh, for different types of site. And then, of course, we have things like sheets and frame solutions. Um, you've already seen these in some of the other images, but you, know, um, you can have the trench sheets or sheet piles. And then those are actually supported intermittently by a, some kind of frame system. Again, there's a vast range of these depending upon what kind of dimensions that you work into, what kind of depths you're looking at, things of that nature. Um, but the thing that we want to point out is that even though all these, are, this is modular equipment, it can be utilized in different ways and it's, it's um, deployed on site 
and it's installed in many, many different ways. I've got a video that I'll show you in a moment, which just highlights one of the installation methods that we have. Um, but if there's anything maybe more specific that's being looked at for any given site, we could always look at a way to install it appropriately so it fits the purpose of what you might be trying to achieve in terms of, you know, discovering the real Charlemagne or whatever other discoveries going on at the time. So this is just a quick video. Um, I just wanted to highlight within this, and, and this actually, the, the already pointed out um, everything's made to be quite intuitive I sometimes think of it as being akin to you go to Ikea to buy a bookcase and you get your instructional guide for it it's the same kind of principle that we work to everything has to be quite straightforward and laid out clearly but imagine that bookcase is kind of made of Meccano much bigger that's the kind of view um, so in this particular instance, <clears throat> they're going to follow the drawing. It's all sequential. This particular uh, installation that we're going to look at here is a no-toe solution. So it's not intrusive. You're not driving sheets all the way into the floor and then maybe, you know, cracking through something that you shouldn't do. Um, it's a very staged, um, it's very safe, actually, kind of uh, sequencing. Um, obviously, things are, are chocked up um, on the wood on the wood chocks and things can be packed out as well so that we're eliminating gaps and spaces um, hydraulic systems are obviously used uh, for things like this and you'll see as you go down and down it, it kind of goes down in the stages that are required but with this being a sheet and frame solution it's pretty robust and pretty strong you might have a big wall in and around the location as you did on the on this uh, animation example here you can see it in the background there there might be something else close by as well so there's always risks to consider. Dave's already touched on that. Um, and basically what we're doing is also considering things like access and egress, which is obviously part and parcel of the safety element of what we're doing. And we're also looking at the logistics. You've got an excavator there. They need a digging window because the trend sheets are sitting quite high at the minute. And to be able to reach down into it is difficult to start off with. So there's quite a clear process and method to be able to uh, successfully complete these works or, or certainly continue the works until you get down to the level that you need to. Um, obviously safety is, is forefront to what we're actually doing. So everything should be chained up and appropriately supported. And then what actually happens is these are depressurized and then lowered into the excavation as it's steadily dug down. Um, and this is just, again, then becomes a repetitive process. So it's um, this stage again, just continues down until eventually, hopefully, we then find the gold nugget that we're actually looking for. Can't actually advise you where this location is because MGF takes credit for the find. Um, so yeah, by and large, I hope that gives you just an idea about the kind of uh, processes that are uh, incumbent to actually carrying out a temporary works installation. It's a slight oversimplification. It can obviously um, take a few more steps than that. Uh, just a couple of examples of actual archaeological jobs that we're involved with. In 2014, uh, Metrolink in Manchester at Cross Street, it started out where we were just supplying a contractor with a typical install. Um, alarm bells started ringing when they started to discover upwards of over 10 corpses um, within the dig. Um, thought there'd been a bloodbath. It turns out that the Unitarian Chapel close by in the 1800s, it initially used it as like a grave site for one or two people. That two became 10, that became 50. It precipitates as these things usually do. Um, and in the end, they found over 100 corpses. So obviously they had to dig down. This one job became about 14 for MGF, which commercially was great, wasn't it? Um, but they went through, um, obviously they had to, you know, appropriately uh, exhume and then inter these bodies in a suitable location elsewhere uh, so it ended up being quite a large job that grew arms and legs this is another one that was carried out a couple of years ago at west end gate this is just a simple box solution um, where i just explained before 
uh, you excavate the ground and then you push the box down and they just wanted to sequentially go down say 500 mil increments or so until they got to the level that they needed to do so and this just on the right here just shows the analysis that we do to make sure that the 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 ground that's around there and with an appropriate load it, it doesn't um it doesn't over exceed the box it's the ground is not going to make the box weak uh, the safe working load of the box isn't exceeded basically uh, i actually did this job a couple of years ago i didn't have enough on the drawings to actually show you but this was in a within a building um and very similar to the video that i showed you it's a sheet and frame system and we just lowered it down but we had to appropriately specify sheets and frames that wouldn't move very much minimal deflection it also had to be strong enough to take the load of the of the wall of the building so there was a few things that we needed to consider but it was done so in such a way that it was a very very safe and robust design um, and typically something like that when they're building is quite challenging because you're obviously always worried about the surrounding area and, and you know what could potentially go wrong with things like that. This is just another very quick video. Um, it's, this one's even quicker than the other one. Uh, but it just gives you an example of the, the vast array of different types of temporary works equipment that are available um, from MGF. Um, we have our own uh, research and development team and they actually come up with new systems, um, new, uh, I mean, you, you, you can get problems within industry and they even look at like refinements of the existing equipment that we've got, even down to, you might wanna to have to lift a specialist piece of equipment within an excavation. We have a lifting division. I'm not really gonna go into that too much, but basically as, as time goes on, uh, we develop new products, and new systems, which can be incorporated into the construction industry and general excavation practice. Um, so by and large, this is just a, a little bit of an overview of, you know, like a, a kind of typical site where you could utilize a, a number of uh, products um, within an area. Uh, and as time goes on, you know, we'll adapt and we'll, we'll change and we'll refine all these products so that they, you know, they, they can fit other uh, applications also. I'm not going to go into massive detail about this, but what I did want to point out to you, because Dave's already mentioned a, a fair number of these, and when we actually provide a, a design document, a lot of these are cited. Um, it's very heavily regulated what we do. We work to the British standards, we work to the serious standards, um, even down to when we actually complete a design, or let's say, for instance, we receive a, um, an inquiry that will be allocated to an engineer who then designs it. And then another appropriate engineer of significant experience and knowledge, such as Dave, will then check it to ensure compliance. It has to suit the standards and the codes. It has to be safe. It's got to be buildable, robust, so on and so on. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of regulation in terms of what we do. So it's a very controlled process. Um, I hope you've actually gathered that from the first part of the presentation. Anyway, there's a lot of processes that we follow in terms of um, getting to the end result of providing a suitable design. Um, so the MDF approach sounds quite heroic, this. And in many ways it is um, about protecting nearby structures, people, um, workers in excavations. It is actually true, of course. Uh, the safety element in terms of access and egress to a site, we have the edge protection built up on the side of an excavation so someone can't lean in and then accidentally fall into it. Um, we're stopping the ground from moving in and around uh, a location as well. Just very quickly, what does a good um, excavation look like? Well, generally, um, I can't remember exactly who it was who said it, but if it looks good, it is. I think it was the, maybe the inventor of the bouncing bomb. Somebody might know. Um, but typically, if you've got a tidy installation, everything's actually pumped out appropriately um, and it's all aligned well. Um, that's a good kind of installation for, for temporary works. The alignment and the sides are all done properly. It's not all crooked and bowed in. The, the, the sheets themselves are um, aligned properly. All the appropriate safety equipment is all um, installed uh, as well. Quite a large excavation that, but again, similar kind of um, process. And as you can see from the appearance of it, it's quite tidy and well laid out. Um, everything's um, in the appropriate location. And that's just... I mean, you may never get an excavation on an archaeological site that big, but if you do, 
We've got stuff, just so you know. So that's um, <clears throat> myself and Dave's contact information. Um, there's actually a couple of other um, websites that you can view some of the, cross-reference some of the information on. Uh, there's a stack of business cards there. Please feel free to take one. If you've got any queries on anything, you can contact us. We're very happy to share information with you. Um, yeah, and moving forward, if you've got any inquiries on anything you may want us to look at, please feel free to get in contact.